Solve the World, Episode 5, The Sunset Limited. Hi! Eyes closed. Ignore. Hi! Who is that? Who is here with me in this place, in this blood? Hello! Wake up, wake up, wake up! Jennifer Dash woke up. Looming over her like a colossus stood a seven-year-old girl outfitted in overalls and a big mouth far from being proportional to the rest of her face. The girl sat on the edge of the couch by Jen's stomach. Who are you? The girl inquired. Foggy-eyed, Jen opened her mouth to respond before realizing she wasn't sure how to answer. For the first time, it dawned on her that she'd never caught the boy's name. He was just the boy. Hi, I'm... I'm Jen. Who, who are you? My name's Margaret, but everyone calls me Scout. Scout? Why Scout? You know why, silly. Jen really didn't know. Not even slightly. Thankfully, Scout was a big talker. That big mouth of hers would take her far. Because of To Kill a Mockingbird. It was our mother's favorite book. And movie. Book and movie. Was? Yep. She's dead now. Oh. Oh. I'm so sorry. I know. Everyone is. Scout flailed her arms about reenacting some vaudevillian opera in her mind. She recited the play in many voices. My sincerest condolences. She was a wonderful person. So sorry you never got to know her. You have to be a big girl now for your father. la di la di la di la 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 Scout sang the last part for no apparent reason. Will you cook me some breakfast? Oh, um, sure? What do you want? Cracker Jacks. Cracker Jacks. Cooked? I like them in milk. Oh, and they're too high in the cabinet for me to grab. Atticus puts them there because he says that I'll eat them up too fast if I can grab them on my own. Atticus. That must be the father's name. Or the boy's. It sounded to Jen like more of an adult name than a teenager's. It didn't fit the boy at all. He should be a... a Brad. Or maybe a Stephen. Uh, yeah, uh, a Stephen McAllister. Something warm and grand like that, Jen thought. But I can grab them. I just have to pull over the chair and climb up on the oven. The last time I almost fell, so I think it's a better idea if you get it for me. Plus, the milk's too heavy for me to pour. I always spill it. I used to kind of like to spill it on purpose because then Salvador would lick it all up. But Salvador's dead now, too. Salvador was our dog. If Salvador ended up being a manservant in this mini-mansion, she was out of here before they forced her to be Scout's milk-lapping governess. Against the wills of her achy body, Jen got up and shimmied over to the kitchen. There, Scout said, pointing Jen toward the Cracker Jacks and Bowls. After pouring Scout's Cracker Jack cereal, the two ladies sat at either end of the kitchen table. You gonna have anything? Jen was hungry. Her stomach made her quite aware of this fact. I think I prefer my Cracker Jacks without milk. Oh, okay. Jen grabbed the box, and as a display of playful behavior, she took a handful of Jacks and smashed them into her mouth. Hey! 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 Stop that! Stop that! I thought she was being funny, but the stern condemnation emanating from the seven-year-old begged to differ. Jen tried to gargle out a, What? But her mouth was too full to make the T sound with her tongue. We didn't pray for us. We have to pray. Ugh. And who taught you to talk with your mouth full? You're not allowed to do that in this house. Spit it out. What? I said, spit it out, young lady. There will be none of that conduct in the further house. Go on, spit it out into your hand. Go on, spit it out. Into your hand. Weirdly ashamed, Jen bashfully pushed the jacks out of her mouth into the palm of her hand. The scout was sure into proper etiquette. Now, hold out your other hand and I'll pray for us. Jen did so immediately, not wanting the drill sergeant to make her do anything else debasing. Now close your eyes and bow your head. Jen followed orders, but as all first-time prayers are apt to do, surreptitiously peeked to see what magic voodoo occurs in the midst of a real child's prayer. As far as Jen could see, Scout over there was a true believer, hands outstretched, head bowed, eyes sealed tightly shut. Dear God, thank you for this day, for this nice weather, and for this breakfast. 
Please be with Daddy today and with Atticus, and keep them both safe all day long. And thank you for our guest today, Jen. Please nourish her body with the food she eats, and please heal her of her boo-boo. Oh! (laughs) Scout giggled and covered her laughs with her hands. Jen smiled and saw Scout staring up at her. Oh, okay, pause. You can look up now. Pause. You can pause prayers, Jen thought. Neat. I'm sorry about that. Atticus gave me orders not to talk about your head wound. I'm sorry. That was very, very impolite of me, and I should have never said that. It's okay. I'm not offended. Do you want to know how I got it? Yeah. Well, I was- Wait! 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 We didn't finish praying. Oh, goodness gracious, dearie me, we better start over. Jen watched Scout take the position again. The Cracker Jacks in Jen's hand were getting soggy and seeping through the cracks in her fingers. It would have been disgusting had she not been so amused by Scout's insistent orders. Jen bowed her head. Unpause. Dear God, thank you for this day and for this nice morning and for this breakfast and for Daddy and Atticus and Jen and breakfast. I'm sorry I pointed out Jen's injury. Please forgive me and give me a good day. And please tell Daddy to bring home a puppy when he gets back from his trip. Amen. Scout looked up at Jen. We can eat now. Scout plowed into her bowl. Jen, on the other hand, found a trash can to dispose of her soggy remnants. So are you my brother's new girlfriend? The question made Jen blush. If she were honest with herself, she'd undoubtedly respond that she'd like to be the boy's girlfriend. She'd never been anyone's girlfriend before, and she suspected that love was going to play into her formula for solving the world. So it certainly wouldn't hurt to have some experience in that arena. Before Jen could verbalize any of these thoughts, though, Scout countered with, My brother's brought lots of girls over. He's had lots of girlfriends. Oh, well, hmm. I just met your brother last night. Scout was incredulous. And he brought you over already? To meet me? Wow, he must really like you. At this, Jen's survivalist instinct clicked in. She sat back down at the kitchen table, only now she chose the seat closest to Scout. Touching her bandages, Jen was in gear now. Smiling and staring at Scout, she started in. Well, let me tell you my story. Okay. I was in New Orleans, hunting for alligators. Ew! You really do that? Absolutely. How do you think I pay the bills? Oh. Daddy complains about bills a lot. That's why Atticus got a job, I think. Yep. Adults have to get jobs, and mine was to catch gators. Anyway, I'm trudging through the swampland, right? Right. And suddenly, an alligator comes up from behind me. I was hiding behind a big tree root. I was so mad at myself, Scout. I never let a gator get on my flank. I knew I was a goner. I can only face alligators straight on, head to head. That's the only way girls like us can win. So I pretty much know I'm gonna die, right? Like, right then and there. This is the end of my life. This alligator, which was ginormous by the way, well, he was just gonna eat me whole. So I turn, hoping I can at least look my killer in the eyes before it eats me for supper. When suddenly, Jen smacked the table with both hands for extra emphasis. Suddenly, there's a great big splash coming from behind the alligator. I thought maybe it was a big snake falling down from a tree limb. Sometimes they do that, you know? I know. Right, so I'm thinking maybe this is an anaconda or something like that because I see thrashing. Whatever it was that came up behind this alligator, it's attacking. The two are just just going at it. I'm thinking maybe this anaconda didn't just fall from the trees above. Maybe this thing's hunting the gator. That thought kind of freaks me out a little. I'm used to gats, right? but not so much gat hunters. But there's no time to fret and ponder. I dive under the water and swim away. I paddle, 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 paddle. And once I'm far enough away that I think I can take a look at what's happening, I see a girl in the water. And so I panic, right? Uh, right. So I swim back towards the fight. So I'm thinking she somehow decided to climb a tree and then fell from that tree right behind us. I'm thinking I've got to save this girl. So I'm swimming and I'm swimming and I'm swimming. But as I get close... Whack! Again, Jen slams her fists on the table. I'm hitting the head with a fin. A fin? Alligators don't have fins. But you know what does? What? Mm, Dolphins. But you said you saw a little girl there. I thought I did. I saw an alligator fighting a girl, and then I was hit by a fin. I don't get it. Don't you see? It wasn't a little girl after all. It was a mermaid.
Jen didn't get the response she was looking for. How did you really get hurt? I told you, I was thwacked by a mermaid's fin while it was saving my life from the crocodile. Hey, you said it was an alligator. Alligator, crocodile, who's to say, really? There aren't any crocodiles in Louisiana. Jen was on the ropes. Maybe it escaped from the zoo. Indignation glared back at her. She decided to change the subject. So, is your brother coming back anytime soon? No, but he left a note for you. The scout ran over to the coffee table next to the couch, grabbed an envelope, and delivered it to Jen. I was supposed to give it to you as soon as you woke up. Huh, oh, is that so? Jen didn't hesitate to open the note. It read, Good morning. Sorry to have to run on you like this, but I have a plan. Go to the train station and board the 1.37 p.m. train heading west. Don't buy a ticket. Just hand this note to the conductor when he comes by. He'll know what to do with you. I'll write you. Sincerely, Atticus Furlick. After a shower, a goodbye to Scout, and a long, meandering walk to the train station, Jen boarded the Sunset Limited. The sign said the train went to Los Angeles. Whoa. Southern California. The Pacific Ocean. Had the boy really worked this all out? A bit nervous, Jen took a seat. The train was lovely. It glided through farmland, piney woods, and flatlands with quiet fortitude. Jen considered napping to pass the time, but thought it best to avoid the blood-stained walls of her subconscious. An hour or so went by before the conductor made his way down the aisle, requiring tickets of all the train's inhabitants. Jen worried a bit, but told herself to have faith. Atticus clearly came from a rich family, and he certainly was a thoughtful young lad, so surely he wouldn't lead her into a trap. Then again... He had lots of girlfriends. Maybe he's just a player. But what would he be playing me for? I'll probably never see him again. The thought crystallized in Jen's mind, and a deep sadness pervaded her soul. She barely acknowledged the conductor when he came chirping by, so enamored with her own sudden feeling of loss. She really liked that boy. Ticket, please. The conductor smiled down at her. He had a bristly mustache that betrayed the officialness of his conductor's outfit. That stash deserved to be latched onto a goofball, not anyone in a uniform. Jen handed the note to the conductor without looking up, as if her note was a common ticket itself. He examined the contents, stuffed the letter in his pocket, and exchanged it for a much more respectable-looking paper. He handed the new ticket to her. I'll be back after I do my rounds. The two of us have much to discuss. And just like that, he walked away. Tickets, please, he said cordially to the next row over. Jen couldn't believe it. It was like she'd won a golden ticket. There, in her hand, a one-way ticket from Lake Charles, Louisiana to Los Angeles, California. Maybe praying really works. Somehow, she'd gone from the depths of dollhouse despair to being pampered by a beautiful boy in a serene train ride to the City of Angels itself. Not but 20 minutes later, the stashed conductor returned. He sat himself down right beside Jen. Atticus tells me you're on a quest. Jen smiled. The boy was telling other people about her. That had to be good news. That's right. I'm out to solve the world. That's what I've been told. Here. He handed her a long piece of paper. It looked like it had been filled out on a typewriter. On the top of the page, in big, thick letters, the title read, Ten Guidelines for Jennifer Dash. What is this? How do you know my name? I'm Joseph Further, Atticus and Scout's father. I'm pleased to see that my son wasn't lying. You're a very pretty young girl. 
Jen blushed at the compliment, but still remained perplexed. Clearly picking up on her unease, Conductor further continued. Atticus told me about your quest and how you're just getting started. We got to talking and decided that every journeyman, or journey woman in your case, needs advocates. Adventures always start fun, but they inevitably lead to real danger and conflict. Oh, I know, Jen felt she needed to add. Without missing a beat, the conductor continued. Worse than that, you can lose yourself in the process. Villains will come and go, these outside threats. Atticus said you already ran into one scary kerfuffle, but none of those external dangers compared to what can happen to you internally. I can see you're a good girl. You've got a good soul. Atticus, Scout, and I would like to see that it stays that way. We think this list could help. Joseph further pointed to each guideline as he walked her through it. The way I see it, young lady, you can't live by a set of rules. Why not? Because eventually we all break the rules. We want to break the rules. And then what happens? Jen didn't know. She was out of her element. You give up on yourself. You say, eh, I've already broken one rule. Might as well break the rest. That's how you end up in a ditch calling yourself the Reverend Mudwiggle. Mudwiggle, sir? These guidelines are here for you, Jennifer, not the other way around. If you break them, you break them. We just want you to understand that there's always consequences. Maybe circumstances will arise that will lead you to break a certain guideline. Just ask yourself, by doing this, what consequence do I need to prepare myself for? Is it worth what comes next? Do you get that? I guess so. But I don't really know why I need this, though. My whole point is to not accept the way things are, to find out what the world is like based on what I discover. And that's great. Atticus and I applaud you for that. Absolutely. But no matter who you are and what you're out to accomplish, human beings are always operating under some system, some set of values. So you say you're a completely blank slate. That's great. But if you say, come here, ride on me, world, I promise you you'll be so abused and battered that who you are will become dictated by what's been done to you, not by what you've done. These guidelines are here to support you, Jennifer, to be a comfort for you when all else seems lost. From his back pocket, the boy's father revealed a small book. He dropped it in her lap. Jen touched the cover with her fingertips as she read its mysterious title. Fifty People Whom I Pity, by DTS. With that, Conductor Joseph Further, father to Atticus and Scout Further, got up and walked away. Jen placed the little book aside and reviewed the list of guidelines. 1. Don't kill. 2. Don't involve yourself with sexual conduct of any sort. 3. Don't idolize anyone or anything. 4. Don't owe anyone anything. 5. Don't gamble what you don't have. 6. Don't wage war. 7. Always smile, even when you don't feel like it. 8. When escaping, know beforehand what you're escaping into. 9. Make friends everywhere, but don't trust one friend over another. 10. People will always want something from you. Find out what it is. Hey, this is Dante Stack, creator of Solve the World. I don't care if you're listening to Solve the World for the first time, and it's ten years after I've produced this show. I would still really, really, really appreciate an iTunes review from you. Can you do that for me, please? Maybe you don't want to tip me on DanteStack.com. Maybe you don't want to do anything else. But I want to share this story. This is the whole reason I made this show. It's not a money-making venture for me. At the end of the day, I just want people to listen to this story. So writing a review really helps get us there. The more reviews that are on iTunes, whether it be in America or Ireland or New Zealand or Germany, the more people will end up seeing it because iTunes will list us higher in podcast searches with the more reviews we have. So your review means a lot. And don't just give it a star rating. Actually write some words. That's really helpful. It's also encouraging to me. So please do that. Pretty please. I hope you like this episode. You've got 95 more left. So I assure you things get more interesting and more convoluted and more action packed. Solve the world is a little bit of a slow burn. So stick with it. The music in this episode and every other episode of Solve the World are appropriately attributed on our show notes page at DanteStack.com. Thanks, guys. See you next time. 
Hello, I'm Parker from Missouri, and I've listened to all 100 episodes of Jin's Story. Jin's about to set her roots down in sunny Southern California, only to find answers to questions she wasn't asking. These answers inevitably distract her, perhaps eternally, from her quest to solve the world.